is is today. Uh, as most of you know, this series has been a follow-on from social media for government, ministers of parliament, local government, senators, councillors. And in this series, this is the last one, This is there's around six in each of the series, and it's focusing on universities and um, colleges, higher education. So if you're a social media manager in universities and colleges, you may find this interesting. I just realized I didn't do a sound check. I think it's okay. You know the rules. If there's an issue or crackle or you can't hear me or I'm too loud, try changing your volume, but uh, please let me know. That would be awesome. So I'll be back after the countdown. Hmm getting a couple little errors but I think we're okay that's good um, today is social media for universities and colleges and we're going to look at influences the role of influencers measurement of influencers type of influencers and then you can make a decision whether you want to work with influencers or not I find there's a lot of I don't know confusion and what an influencer is and whether they're a waste of time or just attention grabbing hard-working business people awesome content creators and other things so I want to clarify how we work with influencer programs I think you should find that interesting if you haven't met me before hi my name is Laurel Papworth I because this is a university um, niche I'm a university lecturer and have been actually since the 90s and tutor and mentor and teacher and corporate trainer and all those good things. I'm a Cert 4 adult education trainer. That's neither here nor there but I do know universities, I've consulted with them and I've also lectured in them and I want to bring some of basics of that to the social media campaigns and strategies within the space the education space higher education space the live lectures are every 1 1 p.m. every Thursday Sydney time and if you can't tell from my accent yes I'm Australian I am streaming this from my studio in Australia right uh, let's start I think think with some basics if you have any questions you can ask me in the chat although it's a lecture not a tutorial my tutorials are more group work based and you know classic tutorial stuff um, but I'm happy for you to ask me a question in the chat you have to do it directly as a response to the video not as a new tweet or new YouTube or comment or somewhere else because I'm only tracking comments from Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn and YouTube and directly on the video. So just just to help you with that. Alright, so I, what the first thing that I want to do is to talk about, um, I guess, where influencers sit in the amplification network. And if you're not familiar with that, don't worry, you will be in about 10 seconds. Hmm. Let's put this up on the screen. Where is, where's my screen? I haven't even got my screen set up. There we go. And I think what you should see is good. That'll do. So typically what we're looking at is a university or higher education. If you can't see this, you'll have to let me know. But I have brought the, I put it down to 720. So I think that should work this screen. Um, the university or the college sits up here and does direct channel messaging on social media. So there's the university's Twitter account, the university's Facebook page, the university's LinkedIn account, whatever, and they talk to their direct network. And then they hope that somehow magically it's going to be the 
the social media asset, the, the media asset, the content asset is going to be picked up and then delivered into channels, into communities of interest, CRIs, communities of interest. It doesn't happen by magic, but I think we're past the stage of just hoping that things will go viral. <laughs> I hope we are. <laughs> so the key here often is people think platforms. Okay, I'm, I'm going to create a media asset. I'm knocking my mic. I'm sorry about that. I'm going to create a media asset, for instance, an article, uh, a press briefing blog post, if you like, corporate blog post, or an image, infographic, some kind of an asset, and I'll put it up on my website or I'll put it up on my own channel and we'll see how it gets distributed. And then they think platforms. I want it to go out on Facebook, I want it to go out on Twitter and into YouTube. So what we see is the asset moves from here and then it's plonked on Facebook, plonked on YouTube, plonked out on email newsletters, EDMs, tweeted out, and then put up on a blog. Sometimes what happens is because the platform is has an algorithm that's optimized to deliver the right content to the right audience at the right time, the content gets picked up and then rippled out. So somebody may see an introduction to your university video on YouTube and then share it on Facebook so people can watch the YouTube video on Facebook or they send it out on a tweet uh, with a few hashtags because they're as individuals quite good at delivering the content through the different channels. So the university video is up on YouTube and then it gets tweeted out and magically everybody gets to see it. And often in between there are micro or nano bloggers, nano influencers and then there's the big influences, and we'll get to that in a second. So there's the A grade and the B grade. <laughs> I don't like calling them that, but hey ho, what do I know? So let me put that one. Actually, we'll go to the other. I want to show you the other one. The amplification effect tends to work more like this the content goes up on your channel here and it's only seen by the people who immediately see it and a short time afterwards because there's a short head of activity on social media where the algorithm says what happened in the first half an hour, what happened in the first hour, first two hours and then it often drops off and then later on when things go viral it goes into a J curve so we are sort of looking at a short head, long tail and potentially a J curve take up if you were graphing it. If you are able to drop the content not only in your own communities but in OPs, other people's communities, other organizations communities, what you'll see is that the trigger um, is placed here and then it ripples through student communities, lecturer communities, um, guest lecturers accounts, um, tweeted out through all oh, hashtags. Hashtags are also communities of interest. So hashtag edtech, edu, au, ozteach, all the hashtags are represented as communities. Don't think of a hashtag as being a keyword search. Think of it as a group of people that are connected to those keywords. And even if only one or two people are using that hashtag, the algorithm often picks up on the hashtag as a keyword tag, and that's part of their data set. And so then they'll deliver higher ed hashtag things to people that are interested in higher ed, even if those people don't know what a hashtag is or what to do with them. So we've got um, the, all these are communities of interest. They can be hashtags. And they can just pass from a Facebook group to a Facebook group or a LinkedIn group to a LinkedIn group. The key with influencers as individuals is they sit in the middle here. They have an engaged following, an active, active engaged following. 
a medium to large following. They can have a small niche following and there are some influencers that have almost no following but are still highly influential. Um, we can get into those later but I would suggest that you look at the people who are gathering a channel together and then stop looking at the person who's doing that and just put them to one side and say who are they talking to? Who are they reaching? It's a little bit like a newspaper. It doesn't matter how you personally feel about the journalist or the editor or the talk show host or the radio host. If they are reaching the audience you want to reach, then you're going to have to work with them if you don't have your own channel. And that brings me to the first point about influencers. If I was to ask to say what an influencer is in a nutshell, and I know that this is homework for you and stuff like that, so I don't want to necessarily lead you into a straight answer without you thinking about it and adding your own take to it, but an influencer is someone who is better at creating or finding content. They can be creators or finders, doesn't matter. And creating channels of engaged people than you are. So I need influencers when they're reaching a group of people that I otherwise would have to pay ads to reach or I simply just don't have a YouTube channel that that's, is that engaged or I don't have a, a Facebook group that is that engaged, that large, that active with exactly the audience I want to reach. Some universities do. Sometimes though people like a page to brand with that college or that university, like they'll like the Harvard page, but then they never engage with them again. Mercedes has the same issue. People like the Mercedes page to kind of go, I'm a Mercedes type of a gal. <laughs> I'm a Harvard type of a gal, boy, whatever. Um, and that's it. They just wanted to co-brand. It's up to the influencers to work at a grassroots level to build that channel and to deliver content. Which is going to bring me to a point in a second, which is as you're going through the groups that you're trying to, I guess, connect to, I would strongly recommend that you note the big spiders in the middle of the web because this is what a web is this is what the web is note the big spiders in there and then note the type of channel they've created like who are they talking to is it a um, retirepreneur who's talking about nano education to retirees who might be looking for short courses on topics they're interested in or evening lectures at the university or something like that is it a undergraduate that's talking to high school students about what it's like in the first year at university and so I write the top I write down who they're talking to and just as a tip you young undergraduates probably not talking all the time to senior citizens and the person that's talking to the retirees is probably not talking to the undergraduates. So write down the audience. Write down the voice. Do they swear a lot? Do they talk about the bands and boozing on, taking drugs, partying at uni? Do they, oh, I don't know. Do they talk about the lecturers in a sassy way? I'm going to be kind and say sassy. So articulate the voice style. So you want the audience they're speaking to and the type of voice. And then I also tend to make some quick notes on the campaigns and narrative arcs that they take. So if Mondays is jobs for uni students, um, Monday morning jobs or something like that, if, if Friday is what is on at the university, you know, sports and drama and I don't know, archery or something make a note of their programming guide and the 
top the listicles top tens and things like that just try and get a feel for the type of content they create it's actually easier than you think because most of the established influencers get into a bit of a a rut no it's not a rut it's it's that the audience comes to expect a certain kind of information and and so they stick with what works you know they know that if they do the top 10 things to prepare for exams then they'll do that video every exam period because they know that that's the one that goes off and they get they get the most views and they get the most subscribers and things like that so they're no different than the rest of the marketing people <laughs> um, they watch their analytics quite closely so we've got influencers sitting in here and the key here is not so much the person as the influencer but who they're speaking to how they're speaking to them and what they're speaking to them about so some influencers are more suitable for some campaigns some awareness raising than others on a personal note as somebody who's on every key influencer list out there from Forbes magazines top 50 social media influencers globally and top women on Twitter and all kinds um, the amount of spam that comes through is horrendous and it's spam is information or requests I guess that's not relevant so being asked to do something that's not relevant to my audience my voice or my topics so try and pick your influences and work with them as a relationship rather than a this there is what that is one way that influences are different than journalists with journalists you can have a list of journalists and send them all through the the media release and some of them will pick it up and some of them won't but if you really want if you really want traction you build relationships so that when you call on them they know that you're bringing them exactly the right stuff that they need right that's those two the ripple effect the social network influence let's go on to some other things now um, I'll bring this up I'm hoping you can see it yeah that one I think again if you have any questions please let me know so I start with tools to assess influences especially if I'm working with a new university or new college and I'm incoming if I ask them who are the influences and they're like oh yeah there's a whole bunch but I can't think of their names we start with data <laughs> Um, I, what did I say this morning I think I said it in the last lecture as well in God we trust all others bring data and there is specific data I'm looking for and it's not necessarily how many followers they have I'm much more interested in engagement and in reach so who's this Ashley Wilson is an influencer in cheerleading colleges and universities fashion social media and a model Instagram I'm guessing that's the number of followers like I said I don't use all these tools or I use them from time to time depending on the client so 355,000 followers yeah I'm already logged in annoying and then Facebook 7.9 thousand and on Twitter 23 thousand always remember with Instagram the type of followers are very visual so you'll need to up your visual games if you're going with an Instagram follower uh, this the just to explain that I know we covered it in other lectures but the algorithm data sets such as story types say some people are text story types and some people are are video story types and some people are photo story types and the algorithm does not deliver text story types photos and videos you won't find them on Instagram text story types are academic researchers lawyers 
accountants, people who are used to reading volumes and volumes of words and text, but it, your creative arts, for instance, will be much more likely to be on um, the Instagram, on the gram. So, Three hundred fifty-five thousand followers and around a thousand engagements. Twenty-nine comments, twenty-eight comments, two thousand engagements. I wouldn't have said a university influencer. I would have said fashion modeling. But if you're aiming to speak to young women and bring them into specific courses then if this is where the women are hanging out the young women these are the people that you work with don't look at me i'm just not making up the rules i'm just telling you how it works all right so where are we going next what's your dream place to visit i and she's from houston Houston, Texas. So this kind of question is um, aimed at getting engagement. Um, you've noticed that the algorithm, that the, the tips that come up when you're about to post on these platforms say things like, ask a question. We show it to more people than if you make a statement. So if you don't have a question mark in there, they're not going to show it to as many people. So always play the algorithm as much as you can. Influence.co, I've got lots of influence tools. I don't want to go through them, but I can put them on the blog post if you're interested. I've got them all bookmarked. Some of them are free, some of them aren't. Some of them are free for the freemium, so you get a certain amount free and then you get a premium service. Um, start, I guess, working your way through and finding the ones that suit you. Always remember they may not be speaking about education per se but they're talking to the audience you want to talk to. Uh, when I was looking through and, and, and I bookmark a lot of these articles and I'm looking for influencers, um, again, they don't need to have a large social media following. They need to have a, an engaged social media following and a fair amount of reach. Now, with story time, and you'll remember that from the content calendar lecture, story time is the type of content where you're giving insight into people's stories. Like um, there was, I think we showed one where there was a student who went back, who of, of art and design, who went back to that college or university to teach art and design and it was a it was a story about the student coming home and now being a teacher and reflecting back to current students and potential students you know this works this is where you this is where it can take you I always split up my student personas into what their fear and aspirations are so Someone who's not been at uni yet, who hasn't been through O week, orientation week, who hasn't been through exam week, who hasn't submitted their first essay. It, there's a lot of firsts in there. So finding someone, and this is one of the things with content creators, not everybody can articulate back to the audience in such a way that they go, yeah, that's me. That's so me. I need to follow this person because they get me. They understand me. So finding those content creators is always kind of awesome. Um, so it says here, when teenagers are looking for information on what it's really like to go to college, they rarely consult college brochures <laughs> or university websites. Yeah, no kidding. It's their mums and dads that are doing that. Instead, they just turn to social media. Actually, specifically, they look at FOAF. So they look at the older brother and sisters of school friends. They start there. And then they look at who those people are connected to. And then they find their influences from there. Social media is not 
uh, a democracy, it's a meritocracy. They're looking for merit. They go to the hashtag or location of a school on Instagram and look at the feed to get the feel for the atmosphere. So they're, and this is the thing with hashtags and communities of interest as influencers, is you don't get just one review, you're getting everybody's. Have you ever looked at a review of a restaurant and it's sort of, there's one review and it says it's terrible? But then you see another restaurant it's got 10 reviews that say it's terrible, but it's got 100 reviews that say it's great. And maybe the 10 reviews that say it's terrible says, oh, um, it's terrible if you've got kids, but you don't have kids, so you're not that interested in that. So it's that idea that it, the, the volume allows them to make a decision about branding. So vlogs of moving in, typical day in the life, even just rants, just make people feel comfortable that they know what they're getting themselves into. So that's kind of a, I guess, um, so Heartbeat is a company that connects brands with up and coming and established social media influencers. So that would be a similar one to influence.co I think I've got it bookmarked if I haven't I'll put it up anyway on the blog post the links um, and they're choosing social media influencers we'll get on to the backlash that can happen with influencers shortly I think that's all I wanted to talk about on this one. I want to go on to a couple of the others. So there's this discussion about influencers being paid to promote universities they didn't attend. Uh, this is what I hate about Vice. Let me just see if I can get rid of that. There we go. Um, the challenge is if they don't declare that they didn't go to the university and so, and I'm going to show you some other content around this in a moment. If they don't go to the university and they promote the university, what's up with that? What's fascinating for me is that, <coughs> not that one, where's our other fella, the young man, <laughs> this guy, I think it's this one, yes. So, Jack Edwards uploads a video to YouTube about highs and lows of his life as a Durham University student. It's watched by 162,000 subscribers. This year, the college at which he studies, St. Cuthbert's, has been oversubscribed for the first time. He's been told that the college principal thinks that this is no coincidence. She calls it the Jack Edwards effect. We also call this the Streisand effect, but on crisis comms. It's also called the Stephen Fry effect or being fried, where servers that take applications to things crash because Stephen Fry mentioned that this was happening. Um, people are often surprised to find he has no relationship with the university. And he, people watching these videos say it gives them reassurance that the university is a good option. So in some cases, the universities are ignoring their influences. And I want to talk a little bit about the issues with that. And I said we would get to crisis comms. When colleges don't access their influences, and by the way, lecturers fall into this as well. I've seen this happening with lecturers that go off. They haven't built a relationship. And if there's no relationship, people can say whatever they want about you. So I find that um, when we have a relationship with an influencer, they'll contact us and say, I heard a rumor that this is happening and I need to cover it. Can you explain to me what's going on? I trust you to give me some information before I go live on this. If you don't have a relationship, they just blab. They just say what they've read, what they think, what, they, what they've heard, all the rumors and things like that. And so you can end up fighting crisis comms fires nonstop. 
And yes, like I said, I've seen lecturers and researchers do this as well. I guess, what would it be like? It would be like a journalist feeling that they can call you or call the comms team and ask for a quote. And journalists are much more likely to do it because there's that at least semblance of impartiality <laughs> happening with journalists. With There is bloggers and vloggers, video bloggers, never claim to be impartial. They claim to be passionate, committed, determined to bring to their lovely followers all the information that they need to give them. Um, they never claim to be impartial, so just be aware of that. If we look at uh, videos posted by the universities versus videos posted by influencers, as an example, given that TikTok and Instagram TV and Facebook Live and YouTube Live and uh, Twitter Live, it was called Periscope, now it's Twitter and Snapchat and I said TikTok, yes I did. <laughs> it's so much more likely that an influencer is getting so many more views than the corporate video team in the corporate comms team at the university or college. I don't want to keep pushing that bar up, but just remember that. So Eve Cornwell, a 22 year old trainee solicitor is a successful vlogger who gained 239,000 subscribers while studying at Bristol University and the University of Law. Let's have a look at Eve's channel, 370,000 subscribers. I'm running an analytics program here called TubeBuddy. I'll put a link um, in so that you guys can get a uh, free trial or whatever it is they give me to give you. Law School Finals just shy of a million views. We'll see if she gets there. Lawyer reacts to Kim Kardashian studying law. Every law student. And then um, notice that every all, not everything, a number of things are in series so the content series and the content calendar is developed when you speak to influencers ask them what's coming up on their content calendar some of them will say they don't have one and then when you start working with them they'll say things oh no I can't do that on Wednesday because on Wednesdays I do XYZ or I can't do that for the next four weeks because I'm working with some other group on influence uh, as an influencer so they do have content calendars they just may not have thought it through how they do things definitely like how to make first class lecture notes that's not going to come at the end of the year you know what i'm saying like that these things fit into content calendars engagement calendars promotion calendars influencer calendars or their relationship based influence calendars and others go and have a look at that lecture if you're interested in more life outside of law and that story time the audience likes them listens to them trusts them very few of these channels do well only on the facts and Often this is an error that universities make with their own content creation is that it's very factual based and the story time is just that little bit boring. It's much more interesting to follow someone through crying because they've split up with their boyfriend, um, happy because of their grades at uni, uh, showing what they're wearing to the music festival on the weekend and like it's it's a lifestyle channel that happens to revolve around the university. Whether universities want to do that themselves, I don't think so. I don't know. If you know of any unis or colleges that do, let me know. But that's kind of where the influences are often coming from. Except for engineering. 
engineering personas are quite different. All right, so we, what we've got here is she considers herself part of a community of EduTube or StudyTube creators. So if I go to YouTube and put in EduTube, I just want to see what they've got here. So there's a lot of channels around EduTube. Five days ago, 770 views. TikTok's got one called Top uh, EduTalk, EduTik, EduTalk, I think. So. I'm, I've been I was tracking that at the end of last year I haven't recently let me just go into the filters I want to just check um, view count mostly foreign language I wonder if I can just bring this in uh, da, 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 da. let me go into relevance again we go to edgy tube. Okay, so it's popular overseas. You'd probably want to sort out the different language ones. And again, if you're looking at overseas students coming into the university and trying to research where do they, how do they come to their decision making process? Um, what's the content in to help them the decision come out, <laughs> content in decision out. Um, they may be tracking something like EduTube or what was the other one called? Study Tube. Mm. Things that frustrate me about the study community there's a, quite a bit of navel gazing that happens in these where they complain about each other and what they're all talking about the same things or riffing off each other or whatever I want to do one more because if I go to Twitter and then I search hash study tube According to study tubers, a YouTube community, filming yourself while you study can keep you on track, whether you post the clip to anyone or not. That's interesting. I had seen this and was wondering about it. I've also seen it with the planning community, people that just plan their week in their diaries. And they film it. So this is encouraging all students to film themselves and to create Facebook or YouTube or Instagram, IGTV or something else while there. That's an ad. Um, Ruby Granger 8, keynote speaker at CAN19, talks about her online educational influencer work sustaining motivation to study along with her through StudyTube. So it's study with me's. Some of you will know that I have plan with me communities where people do social media planning with me and we all come together and plan at the same time in a small closed group. So it's just translating across to this kind of education, I guess. <laughs> okay, kind of cool. I like... And this, I want to bring this one back to um, not just finding influences through looking at StudyTube and EduTube and EduTalk for TikTok and all the others. But I like to track the influencers to see what they're talking about. And there's two things there. One is evergreen topics. So how I study better, how I sleep better, how I work and play and study and work-life balance and study-life balance and all those things they're evergreens 
and then they're very good at picking up on the meme worthy things that the algorithm also picks up on a topic that's right hot that's hot right now something that wasn't hot a couple of weeks ago and won't be in a few weeks but is topical right now now some of those obviously have peaks and troughs like studying for exams but others could be oh, I remember when I was at university someone a staff member had their car and they drove it through a march they just got angry and drove through the march at like five kilometers an hour and nobody was hurt but there was an outpouring of outrage and and it was very what we would today would call mean worthy I guess um, everybody was talking about it so those things are really topical another one maybe not quite as dramatic is changing the logo changing the logo of the student union or of the branding of the school or something the football club logo I don't know what do people get their niggers in a knot about these days everything I think um, when I'm looking at I'll oh, come back to here again so when I'm looking at Ruby she's got 12,000 followers and she's following 87 people and I know when I showed this before I showed you how to find vice chancellors lists and things like that and definitely vice chancellors are influencers <laughs> But I want to know who influences the influencers. So she likes only in Waitrose, which is like um, uh, Woolworths in Australia. What is it in America? Walmart, maybe? Matt Rudd, who is the deputy editor and columnist at the Sunday Times magazine who's probably more likely to write an article on her and on university students in general and to call on her for an article um, because it would fit in with the Sunday Times. You wouldn't necessarily find this stuff in the business section of the newspaper. Study Tube Gang, that makes sense. Lavender. Sustainable things that make sense because of millennials and so on. BBC Earth producer, feature writer at the Times. So a lot of traditional media. Probably people that have asked her for an interview. Cambridge Uni grad, Oxford Uni postgrad, YouTuber, tutor, and aspirational Pokemon trainer. Cool dude. Remember, as you find people, you can either follow them, but if you go to their um, account and you go to the dot, 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 you can add and remove them from lists. So you could create a list called Study Tube or University Student Influencers and then put them into Postgrad or you, you know, postgrad, undergrad. You could put the vice chancellors on a list like the one I showed you before. You could put them on something else. Let's have a look at the list they're on. Law commentators and sorry, that's the list they've created. YouTubers. Cambridge study tubers. So here's a whole list of study tubers. You see what I mean by influences unravel other influences, and you're actually seeing the amplification effect in place here. Influences follow inf other influences, and be careful. It's just human nature, but this group of influencers don't talk to this group of influencers. There's politics between them. There's issues between them. There's bad blood between them. You won't necessarily know until you get try to get them working on the same campaign. 
and you ask them to share each other's content and you ask them to comment on each other's content and you're trying to get some sort of cross channel promotions happening and all of a sudden they vanish or they're not able to do that or they're sick or you know the kind of things on this list let me just copy that one I'll take it into the into our study into our Feedly in a moment um, I just want to check and see there are seven members on it so Ruby Granger's on the list, Jack Edwards is on the list, Ibrahim's on the list. So the list has been created with just them on it. Now when I'm on Feedly and I'm in my higher education monitoring area, just add here, I can add the list in. Twitter list for mindset box. Yes, that's it. So if I follow that list in Feedly and I put them in higher ed, let me just get down here. Let's add them to higher ed. Now I can go and find all the different lists and add them into higher ed and I will see the content flowing through this in Feedly. I don't necessarily want to have to manually check 20 study tubers lists and influencers lists to see what they're talking about, what hashtags they're using, who they're connecting to. I would, and we covered Feedly in the social media tools for universities lecture. Anyway, it, it's in the list, it's in the playlist. If you're, or album or whatever it is, Facebook calls them albums, YouTube calls them playlists, I don't know, go and have a look. So that's what I would do, I would just keep going through finding lists that are right on topic, on topic and on target, it must be the right audience. If you're not in the UK, you may not want to be connecting to the UK groups and influencers and so on and so forth. Right. We're almost at question time. I do want to, let's come back to the voice part. Um, engineers talk to other engineers in a very specific way. It's usually techie, geeky, dot points, it's definitely not posing Instagram photos and videos very rarely and it's a if you're wanting to get a message out to the engineering community persona influences to talk to them if however you're trying to change that persona so you want to talk to young women about doing engineering courses you're going to have to find the influences that the young women follow and it may not be an engineer style persona or voice and that is because you know when we meet people when they have a specific voice we decide that voice is for us or it's not if we're trying to change that then we need to find other influences that will help us build a bridge to build a new kind of a voice maybe that sort of short sharp punchy engineering voice is no longer the only kind of voice we want to see in that industry that niche that department so I would suggest that you think through those kind of things um, also the second thing with influences is to remember that they change so a social media influencer in higher education that we worked with I think about 12 years ago has now left higher education and had children She's now back at uh, college, uni, doing postgraduate work. But her content now is all about managing children, part-time job, and study. <laughs> so it's definitely not the kind of rowdiness that she was blogging about years ago. Which is fine, because a lot of her old followers 
have grown up with her and moved along. Just just remember that to to to, to keep working with them but recognize as they it's part of the rites of passage of social psychology. We we're young and footloose and fancy free at uni and then then we we're an older unis, university student, then we we're a married university student, then we we're a married with kids university student and then we we're I don't know <laughs> other postgraduate work and then we we're a retired university student, lifelong learner. And those influences are still effective, but they've shifted their voice and they're now focusing on different types of storytelling. Still relevant, but to the crowd that's moved along and grown with them. So I just want to come to a question. We've only got a few minutes left and it was about a crisis comes and I'm sorry but I had you absolutely right I had that I would talk about crisis comes and I didn't so let me just bring up um, working with influencers and what happens when influencer relationships go bad and I think one of the articles mentions some of the parents that allegedly paid for their kids to get into uni and then those kids were doing had already built up a following online and then it was discovered that they had their places bought at college and things did not go well. Where am I? I'm nattering on and I'm not checking. Um, I need my diagrams. <laughs> and it's this one I do, I think. Okay. My apologies if I have shown this to you before. I'm pretty sure we haven't. Um, I can move this over a little bit. No, that'll do. Okay. When you're dealing with negative criticism at universities and colleges, um, the first thing I do is I identify where it's being driven from. So I mentioned before we've had lecturers leaving bad reviews on Amazon of other people's research books, research papers been put into books. We've had lectures how crappy the university is and they just, the students live streamed it. There's a whole range of things that can happen from home goals, <laughs> people uh, that work or connected to the university and then students and then people who weren't accepted into the university or otherwise I guess the f so and I also look to see if it's justified did this actually happen in the way they're talking about was it a one-off or whatever because that's going to change how you respond like don't deny something if it's true um, you might want to talk about how you're fixing it but uh, look at those things and then if you're just looking at trolls this also this sort of structure framework works I split the responses into the university impersonal voice and then the human voice and I'll explain why we do the human voice in a moment the first thing and thanks by the way for bringing this up in the questions because I had promised to do this and it is the last lecture for universities so I want to cover it we might go a couple minutes over no actually I think we'll cover it you have to choose if you're going to ignore the criticism by ignoring it, I don't mean not monitoring it. Definitely bring it into Feedly. Definitely bring it into your monitoring dashboards. But ignore it because the critic will go away. Um, we get a lot of negative postings on Friday nights, early hours of Sunday mornings from drunk students. And then they delete it the next morning. So didn't need to do anything. But if you ignore it and the critic doesn't go away because it was a valid thing or it's an ongoing issue, you're just going to build a bigger problem for yourself. Uh, go legal on them, absolutely. As a community manager, as a social media manager, your job is to keep the community safe. And if people are making threats to each other, to lecturers, to staff, wherever, you need to go legal on them. You need to bring the authorities in need to document what was being said especially if they look like they're going to delete it or something make sure you've got all that so that if they do do something or before they do something it's reported so that 
others. I don't know, Australian Federal Police, I think, have coverage in Australia for campus. Local police don't. But you'll need to notify the legal department or PR or someone so they know what's going on. Then they can make a decision. Let them escalate it. And escalation charts are critical on social <laughs> media. An escalation chart just means if this happens, contact these people. If this happens, contact these people. And then it keeps being escalated till the right people know that this is going on. Deflection is where you say, oh, I'm sorry that you had that experience. Oh, look, shiny. And you deflect the issue into something else. Uh, it's like children. Oh, you hurt your knee. Would you like an ice cream? And they go from tears to smiling suddenly. And you can do that with communities when it's a mild, small thing like I don't know, the main gates were blocked this morning for half an hour by trucks. And you can usually deflect the issues then. Another deflection is to keep posting things on top of the other thing that's going off so that they have to scan down a long page of content. And we create those social media assets and put them in case of in a in case of emergency break glass area. So we've got content ready to go if we need to bury and deflect something the next one is to remove the comment remove the commenter and sometimes to unpublish it's a drastic move but you can just remember if you do that they may go somewhere else where you have no control at least if you let them rant for a little while you can later on you can unpublish that post and all the comments vanish when you do that I'm just giving you some ideas. I'm not saying this is what you do. You have to choose from these. Educate. Thank you for your feedback. Let me explain to everybody, not just the commenter, why this is inaccurate. I'm a big believer that it's not the person you're speaking to that's important. It's the invisible audience. It's not how you... The minute you say to someone, oh, come and talk to me privately in direct messaging and DMs, all the potential students who are thinking of coming to the university, it looks to them like it's unresolved. Resolve it. Make sure there's closure, a closed loop. So don't just educate the person who is having a bit of a whine. Make sure the others who would have seen it and could see it, see the response. You have to direct message some things. You're going to ask them for their student numbers or you're going to ask them for something that's you don't want published but as much as possible resolve publicly public customer service saves all saves 50 million people contacting you to ask you what's going on because they can all see the response so that's all done in the impersonal voice or the formal voice the corporate voice the vanilla voice whatever you want to call it we shift into the personal voice and we sign our names on when you're confessing um, and you're doing an abject apology <laughs> when you're fighting and you're saying well if you don't like diversity at universities this may not be the university for you you're pushing back you're fighting back and owning yes we stand by our right to have gay and lesbian students at our university if you're not happy, you may not be ready for university or you may not be happy for our university. Whatever your value-based systems are. And fight and owning are slightly different. Fight is where you are you are really pushing back and owning is... Um, oh, what's an example of owning? Uh, owning is putting nerd on a T-shirt and nerd used to be a negative calling that was negative. Or you... You put hug a tree on a t-shirt when people call you horrible tree huggers. Or um, people of colour can call themselves the N-word and they own the N-word but nobody else can really use the N-word. They, they own it. Um, gay people can call each other pufta but I wouldn't because I'm not part of the community. They own the negative criticism yes I'm doing air quotes <laughs> um, because I don't think it's negative <laughs> but but that idea that something that's thrown at them 
you take it and you own it. With fighting, you're just straight out saying to people, bad luck, this is what we believe in and we're sticking with it. Confessing obviously is the opposite. Now I do want to say something about confessing. Don't do the politician's apology. The politician's apology is if we offended someone, then we're sorry. And you know darn well that people were offended and therefore you must say we understand that we deeply offended sections of the community and we are absolutely sorry that that happened that's a different kind of tone and voice and sign it with your at least your initials or a name um, I'll put a link to this uh, framework because it is up on Flickr it's probably up on Facebook as well I'm not sure I don't remember. Did that answer your question? I'm just, sorry, I'm just looking at the comments. Okay, no response to whether it's answering the question, but I think it might have done. With influencers, of course, when their community turns against them because it's discovered they didn't study at the university or their parents paid bribes to get them into the university or they are... Uh, abused a minority section of the community and old tweets resurface because of that you will catch that backlash because you're co-branding with influencers and what i want you to remember is that influencers feel the same way if they get if they jump into bed with the university and then that university is caught with their hand in the till or there is racism at the university that's discovered and emails are distributed that that influencer then comes under fire and will have to cut the relationship and have to apologize to their community because they've co-branded and there's a high risk there for them i think there's sort of this attitude that influencers should just be grateful that um a larger entity is working with them but the risk to to them is just as high as the benefits so and we all know that there are crises from time to time that affect both parties think that through do your research audit your influencer look at their tweets and their instagram posts from years ago try searching a few words like the n-word to see if that comes up uh, in their old feed and having them say oh well i was only 15 at the time and i no longer believe that perfectly true i'm sure not going to help you when the backlash comes so do an audit make sure you understand their values make sure their values are your values their voice is your voice and things like that <gasps> i've gone over time and my apologies okay so that's the end of the university series there'll be a new series up on thursday next week at 1 p.m new lecture series haven't quite decided what it's going to be yet so i'll let you know during the week it won't be universities <laughs> uh, what else did i want to tell you monday mornings 10 45 a.m social media news where i go through the news of the week i catch up on the news of the week you catch up with me i need to take an hour out on mondays and figure this stuff out so we do it together thursdays are more structured going through uh, more a lecture series um, not maybe as formal as an actual podium lecture series but you know as close as i can get doing a, a live stream uh, without an actual <laughs> curriculum in front of me more I write my own curriculum for these things so there you go if you want to join a private session with me please have a look I think it's at bookme.laurelpapworth.com or if you want to join some of the group work look at training.laurelpapworth.com and uh, otherwise I'll see you on Monday for the news and I'll see you on Thursday for the lecture. If you'd like me to cover a lecture series on your niche or your industry, if it's not university and colleges, please let me know. 
What's winning so far and may happen next Thursday is hospitality. That was a big one. Um, and I'm happy to do that. So look at those. Okay. Thank you for your time. I'm going to have to love you and leave you. And we're doing the countdown clock. Thanks. Bye.